Thank you, Phil. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about. You said it well. I've already given my disclosure a few minutes ago. So, as this group knows well, most bariatric operations cause remission of type 2 diabetes in the majority of cases. And as I mentioned earlier, it's now become very clear that this occurs not just because of secondary consequences of, of weight loss, but also because of weight-independent anti-diabetes mechanisms, which are numerous and powerful. The clinical significance of that finding is this. If you start doing surgery on lower BMI people, for example, for their diabetes, they don't lose so much weight. The lower your BMI is with them, when you start, the less weight you lose, and therefore you enjoy fewer weight-dependent anti-diabetes <coughs> effects. But there's no reason to believe that these weight-independent effects aren't fully engaged at any BMI level. And those two observations impel us to consider the use of these operations as metabolic surgery, used to treat diabetes as the primary intent, even in lower BMI people who don't lose so much weight. And I think this concept of diabetes surgery or metabolic surgery has become relatively well accepted in academic circles. I'd like to think that that, start, that got a jump start uh, some time ago when we co-organized the first Diabetes summer Surgery Summit, which was co-organized by my chair here, Phil Schauer, or Carter Cohen, um, Lee Kaplan, and myself. We brought together leading diabetes experts from around the world, developed consensus statements, and agreed with high, agreed with high consensus that weight-independent anti-diabetes effects are engaged by intestinal bypass operations, and we recommended lowering the BMI threshold for people with inadequately controlled diabetes. Um, reflecting some acceptance of that in the Cognoscenti, within the year after that conf conference, the American Society for Bariatric Surgery changed its name, and it included the word metabolic. And then very rapidly thereafter, equivalent changes in name occurred in the equivalent societies in Brazil, Italy, Venezuela, India, the international version, Asia Pacific, and so on. I don't think I know of any major bariatric surgery society left in the world that hasn't changed its name to include the word metabolic. But despite that high degree of acceptance within academia, until very recently, just last year, you would still not see any mention of metabolic or bariatric surgery anywhere on this all-important treatment algorithm for the use of the treatment of diabetes that gets put out once a year by the American Diabetes Association and its European equivalent, and is used as a Bible to tell people like me how to treat diabetes. So why was it the case that this hasn't been recognized until recently? Well, I think it's because until very recently, there was a lack of level one evidence from randomized trials directly comparing surgical versus non-surgical approaches to diabetes, which is what the people who designed that algorithm are used to. It's very, very hard to do such studies because very few people are willing to be randomly allocated into treatment options as diverse as a major operation or diet, exercise, and meds. Most people have an opinion about that. In our own personal studies in Seattle, we need to approach about 50 to 100 people to get one person willing to be so randomized. But despite those operational challenges, uh, many groups in the, in the field have now weighed in and, and filled in this knowledge gap. Phil Shower is a leader among them, my own study and others uh, also published. So this is a um, slide shown earlier, or a variant of it, a meta-analysis we did for the second Diabetes Surgery Summit, where we've shown the 11 then published RCTs of various different medical lifestyle interventions compared to various different surgical interventions for diabetes. And then what shows in this forest plot is what's the relative likelihood that one intervention or the other will be outperforming based on the primary outcome of the study, which was either diabetes remission or glycemic control. And what you can see is surgery won every time. But what's interesting about this graph is I had it organized in ascending order of baseline BMI of the cohorts, with the lightest groups at the top ascending to the heaviest groups at the bottom. And the breakpoint for those studies in, in which the cohort was on average below or above 35 at baseline is shown in the dotted line. So just look, use your eyes, and you can see that visually those results look similar above and below the dotted line, and they are statistically. So that provides us with a rare level of evidence called level 1A, um, something that's derived from a meta-analysis of only RCTs, telling us that the degree to which a variety of surgical interventions for diabetes is better than a variety of medical lifestyle interventions, including very, very rigorous ones like our Crossroads trial, is equally true whether your BMI starts above 35 or below. Very strongly challenging the use of this arbitrary line as a main criterion for surgery. Along those lines, I'd just show you some supported, supportive data from another RCT that I've co pi in with, with Shoshang Shaw, the COSMID trial, a randomized trial of gastric bypass versus a moderately intensive medical lifestyle intervention for South Asian people with a BMI between 25 and 35. And we found that the medical lifestyle group in this uh, 
this group did pretty well. They dropped their A1C from 9.5 to about 8 and kept it there for uh, two years. But the surgical group did a lot better, dropped their A1C from 9.5 to 6.5 and kept it there for two years. And the surgical group dropped their diabetes medications a lot more. For the purpose of this per particular discussion, we looked in and asked the question, within our cohort, were results any different between the people who were a little heavier or a little lighter within our, our group? So we subdivided this into people whose BMI was above or below the median at the baseline, which in this group was about 30, and then did a subgroup analysis. This was a, a RCT of 80, 80 subjects. So as expected, those who were heavier at the start lost more weight, which is always seen. That's in the solid circles. And it was a big difference between the heavier half and the, low, the lighter half. But despite that major difference in weight loss over two years, the A1C lowering was absolutely identical in both groups throughout the two-year period, as was the degree of lessening of diabetes medication use, <coughs> which to me tells, tells you that these weight-independent effects I'm talking about are not only present, but they're powerful, and it further questions the idea of whether 35 BMI has any bearing on the use of surgery to treat diabetes. So summarizing those 11 trials plus COSMID, which isn't quite published yet, so for 12 RCTs of surgical versus medical lifestyle interventions, every one of them has agreed universally that bariatric metabolic surgery is more effective than medical lifestyle interventions for weight loss, glycemic control, especially diabetes remission, improvements in other cardiovascular risk factors, and with acceptable complications for up to at least five years, and with remarkably similar results in people whose BMI starts below versus above 35. So now we come to the table armed with lots of good level one evidence to inform policy and hopefully change the woefully antiquated 1991 guidelines that have been guiding this field for more than a quarter century. And that was the goal of the second Diabetes Surgery Summit that Phil and I and Francesco Rubino and Lee Kaplan took a lead in organizing. So we learned a lot between DSS-1 and DSS-2. And part of it was that we should, or, we should arrange, uh, um, ally ourselves from the beginning with powerful diabetes organizations. So from the start, we grouped with the American Diabetes Association, its European equivalent, the Chinese and Indian Diabetes Society, Diabetes, the International <coughs> Diabetes Federation, which is part of the World Health Organization, and Diabetes UK. So each group supplied us with half a dozen or so uh, people to represent them at the table. And together they constituted 48 people in a voting panel. We worked together for a long time over the better part of a year to develop specific statements in an iterative manner using what's called the Delphi process for consensus building. And the, the um, people who administered that were external uh, unbiased adjudicators outside of the group. They were top editors at um, Nature. So we published our papers in a lot of papers. Uh, first, the premier journal for diabetes clinical research, Diabetes Care, official journal of the ADA, made a special uh, issue for us and published 12 papers that directly came from the, the DSS-2. At the same time, what I consider the premier journal, or one of the two, in bariatric metabolic surgery research, SWORD, published an additional 14 papers directly related and coming from uh, DSS-2. Others have followed, and I'm aware of at least 36 papers in the literature that have now been published because of or about DSS-2, including one in Nature and three in JAMA. And notice this issue of diabetes care has a picture of surgeons on the cover. If that was the first time this medical journal has ever featured surgeons on its cover. And of note, last month, the equivalent official journal of the European version of ADA, EASD, covered its, put its cover uh, as follows with the surgeons on it for the first time in history, acknowledging a paper that I published in that issue with Francesco Rubino. So we're proud that the top two clinical diabetes research journals now have dedicated their covers for the first time in history to a surgical topic based on metabolic surgery. The centerpiece of uh, all our papers from DSS-2 is this what thing we call the, 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 the guidelines paper, in which the group articulates 32 highly consensuated position statements and clinical practice guidelines. And the important thing about them is the final results have been formally ratified by at least 53 societies, scientific societies around the world to date. These are not bit players. They include the ADA, the International Diabetes Federation, the Chinese and Indian Diabetes Societies, EASO, a variety of very powerful and large medical institutions or societies in the United States, and the national diabetes organizations, not surgical, but diabetes organizations, of most major European and many South American countries. It's hard to know this, but as far as we can tell from our research, this, in terms of society endorsement, the SS2 is the most widely ratified set of clinical practice guidelines ever created in the history of medicine or surgery. 
So we, we recommended a lot of things, but in a nutshell, the, the most important thing we did, as the prior speaker said, is um, for the first time, really place metabolic surgery squarely in the overall treatment algorithm for diabetes. And importantly, ADA recognized that, and for the first time in 2017, in its all-important yearly publication of standards of care for how to treat diabetes, surgery was squarely in that algorithm. So it went from a tiny two little paragraphs about bariatric surgery that they had published the same over and over again for years to five and a half pages about metabolic surgery um, and a lot of favorable comments about it. Probably the most clinically important thing we did was recommend that surgery be considered for inadequate controlled diabetes type 2 in patients with a BMI as low as 30 or down to 27.5 for Asians. It may not seem like a very big numerical change to drop from 35 to 30, but it includes a lot of people. So for example, in these NHANES data that I got from Phil, 43% of Americans with diabetes have a BMI between 30 and 35. And worldwide, the vast majority of people with diabetes are under a BMI of 35. So for example, here in East Asian data, where the average Joe with diabetes is walking around with a BMI of 24, fewer than 2% of people with diabetes have a BMI over 35. So I would estimate that there are a few hundred million people in the world with diabetes who previously would not have qualified for metabolic surgery as an option, who now would if DSS-2 guidelines are widely implemented in the world. So where do we stand in terms of that implementation? This is a map of the world, as best I know it, that shows countries which have already adopted at some level a national policies that allow metabolic surgery to be practiced according to DSS-2 guidelines or something equivalent. Singapore, you can't see, Saudi Arabia, India, China, Australia, the United Kingdom, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, thank you, Ricardo, he was instrumental in that. And in the United States, there are an increasing number of large companies that self, large enough to self-insure that have already substituted NIH 9091 with DSS-2 to decide who qualifies for surgery and can have it paid for. Medicare and Medicaid have been actively considering this for a while. So far, they've not decided to do it. Uh, that was disappointing for us, but we hope that eventually they'll come around, and if they do, we hope that would pressure the big insurance companies to follow. What's missing in the field, and this is my last slide, Phil, um, are long-term data from randomized trials of surgical versus non-surgical approaches to diabetes and maybe hard outcomes data. These are really hard and expensive studies to do because the event rates are small, but in the interim, four smaller, shorter, and randomized trials of surgical versus non-surgical approaches, including our own crossroads, Phil Stampede, and two others, all designed to come up with glycemic endpoints for a few years, have formally unified themselves into a single cohort called the Alliance of Randomized Trials of Medicines versus Metabolic Surgery for Type 2 Diabetes. And we've used a lot of fancy statistical techniques to harmonize our methods and metrics so all of our study cohorts are being treated and studied the same. And we just got about a $9.5 million grant from the NIH to move forward for long-term studies of these people, which hopefully will provide some hard outcomes data heavily needed in, the, in, the, in this field. Uh, in my career, I've had the pleasure of working with many talented people in Seattle and elsewhere. Some of them are mentioned there for this particular um, talk. I'd just like to shout out again Francesca Rubino, Phil Schauer beside me, and Lee Kaplan, who are, uh, are the architects with me of the DSS-1 and 2. And I thank you for your attention.